Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. I am your host, Mike DiGirolamo, bringing you the news and inspiration from nature's front line. This podcast was recorded and edited on Gadigal land. Human beings have a long and complicated history with bears. They are and have been an important symbol for many indigenous cultures and have also inspired the easily recognizable stuffed icon known as the teddy bear. Today, however, these fuzzy ursine individuals only have eight remaining species, six of them classified as vulnerable by the IUCN. Their threats range from habitat loss to climate change and, of course, to human encroachment and conflict. Here to talk about these issues on the podcast today is award-winning Canadian journalist Gloria Dickey, whose new book, Eight Bears, takes a deep look at all the bear species and how humans interact with them. Previously, Mongabe published a Q&A with Gloria detailing some of the key findings in her book with journalist Jeremy Hance, which I encourage you to check out as well. In this conversation, we cover larger contextual questions surrounding humans' interactions with this charismatic mammal, and arguably some of the lesser publicly appreciated threats, how and what bear species are the most threatened, and the lessons humans are learning from past mistakes and also ones we are still failing to grasp. One notable part about this conversation is when we discuss a former U.S. Park Service practice from the 1920s of inviting the public to come and watch bears eat from specifically designated trash dumps and the ensuing decades of rehabilitation it took to undo the damage from this. But while there are definitive conservation success stories for bears, such as with the giant panda, the brown and the American black bear, much like with many of the environmental problems humans grapple with today, the future holds a lot of challenges ahead for these adored mammals. Gloria, thank you so much for joining me today on the Mongabay Newscast. Welcome. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm doing good. And uh, we're here to talk about your new book. So can you sort of just give us an overview of why you selected the topic of bears for this book? What, what was the impetus behind this book? Yeah, so I I grew up in a part of Canada that did not have any bears. And so as a child, I was always like very, I guess, you know, wanting to move to places that had big charismatic megafauna. And in 2013, I moved to Boulder, Colorado to do my master's in environmental journalism. And at that time, there were all these black bears kind of coming down from the Rocky Mountain Front Range into town, getting into garbage, getting into trouble. Parks and Wildlife was utilizing a lot of those bears. And so as a master's student, I began kind of following those bears. And then that became my project. And eventually those bears led to, you know, looking at Yellowstone grizzly bears and looking at polar bears in, in the Arctic. And that kind of spiraled out uh, to thinking about, you know, how many bears exist? How many bears are there? And I found out there were eight bears. And I was like, oh, it's a really manageable number for a book. <laughs> you know, there's few lines, you have over 40 of them, you know, primate hundreds of those. But I felt like eight bears, many of which people had never heard of, could make a really nice kind of comprehensive global study for a book. You start this book by examining, I guess this is probably one of my favorite bear species, the Andean bear. Um, what is so unique about the Andean bear or the other term that is referred to, I believe, spectacled bear? Exactly. So the Andean bear is the only bear species left living in South America. There did used to be many more bear species, part of this group of bears known as the short-faced bears, but a lot of those went extinct during the Pleistocene. Um, so today it's kind of unique among the eight bears in terms of it doesn't have any really close relatives in the bear family. And it looks a little bit different too. It has these kind of shorter, stocky limbs. It spends a lot of time in the trees. It builds these little tree nests where it kind of sleeps and it get, you know, gathers fruits and things to eat. And of course, it's face. They're the only bear species that can be identified simply by the markings on their face, similar to how scientists might identify tigers by their stripe pattern. Spectacle bears have these kind of blonde, glasses looking, spectacle looking markings that scientists can use to um, select individuals. And um, something that you cover in the book, which I thought was really cool, conservation biologist Susanna Paisley, um, she sort of posits that El Lanzon isn't actually a jaguar, but could be the Andean bear species, if I have that correct. Can you sort of explain to our listeners what this means exactly? So, um, Alanzon is this central deity in Andean, historic Andean culture, Shavan culture. And there's a temple where that features this, this figure very prominently. And a lot of people think it's a jaguar, that the jaguar is kind of a central cultural element, um, of these civilizations. But 
if you look at it, it actually looks a lot more like kind of how a bear, how North American indigenous cultures represent bears. It looks very similar in that way. So one of the things that had struck me when I was traveling through Peru and Ecuador was just how few depictions of bears there were in kind of ancient artifacts. It was all, you know, monkeys, snakes, harpy eagles, jaguars. And it was quite strange because bears as a motif are such a central element to cultures in the Northern Hemisphere. And there were bears around historically in these areas, and yet we don't see depictions of them. And so Susanna Paisley kind of put forward this idea that perhaps there was a taboo in depicting Andean bears in other art forms outside of this central chief deity because that was a bear. So doing other kind of representations could be, uh, you know, I guess, a bad thing compared with the, the central deity or offensive to the central deity. Um, so kind of the, the run of it. And um, you kind of examine like, I, I'm not really spoiling anything for, for listeners here, but, you know, all these bear species face a number of threats. But the, but the one that you kind of like examine with the Andean bear is climate change related in the fact that as, you know, as temperatures change and they have to move locations, there's only so many places for them to go. So can you, can you explain to our listeners how exactly the Andean bear is threatened? Andean bears live in the cloud forests, which are these really special, unique forests, tropical forests that are basically moisturized or quenched by clouds that float through and across the mountain slope. Um, So it's kind of this very narrow niche or band of forest on the mountain. They also live higher up in the kind of highlands or the paramo of the Andes as well, but they don't seem to be using the lower elevation, which is the Amazon. So they're not going down foraging the forest. Uh, and that's concerning to scientists because we are seeing the cloud forest shrinking and projected to shrink quite a bit due to climate change as climate change removes that kind of cloud immersion point further upslope. And eventually you're just off the mountain, right? You can kind of shift the habitat up. Then you're hitting the highland, the paramo, and then you're off the mountain. So if you're shrinking it from below and the bears don't seem to be using the Amazon, that's concerning for habitat loss. And so right now, scientists are looking at, well, why are these bears not using the Amazon? Because in theory, they should be. There's lots of food there. The climate's not that different. You know, bears could survive there just as well. Um, so thinking maybe it's because there's other kind of, you know, mesocarnivores, other, other, you know, jaguars and other animals that might threaten them there. But they're using all these camera trap studies to try and figure out could bears move lower down instead? Because otherwise, that, that, that's a big threat to them that they would lose habitat when they're already being threatened by things like mining and agricultural expansion as well in South America. And so as the climate continues to change, do you think that of the eight bear species, and another one that you point out, which you say is pretty much sort of doomed, I hate to use the word doomed, is the polar bear species. It seems to me that the Andean bear is kind of like next down on the list, or at least one of the prime threatened species. What is your projection then for the Andean bear in the decades to come? I think it's quite tricky for bears that are threatened by climate change, not just habitat loss, because you can you know, address habitat loss, mining, leases, agricultural expansion with policy on the ground, but tackling climate change is a much bigger global issue that we haven't made much progress on. So I think with, with that in mind, and if the bears cannot move lower down, then, then, the, then it's quite grim for them. But I, I think they do have more adaptability and flexibility than polar bears and that they do have such a big range in that area, you know, that they, they can eat different foods. They should be able to use lower down forest. The polar bear can't, you know, just suddenly hop onto land and eat food there. The spectacled bear or the Andean bear could do that. So scientists aren't quite sure what to expect when I spoke with them. They were kind of like, it could be very bad news, but at the same time, you know, bears in general are just very adaptable animals. Um, and spectacled bears too, you know, they've, they've kind of eked out an existence here that, that's uh, in an environment that might be hostile otherwise. So I hate to sort of like ask you to rank the species by vulnerability, um, but you did point out that you believe that polar bears are sort of like the most vulnerable. Um, how would you rank the remaining bears like from the top three down? I think my perception would differ, you know, from simply like the IUCN classifications of like, you know, threatened, vulnerable, you know, endangered, critically endangered, because, you know, to me, I, I think the panda bear in my perspective kind of throws it out of whack, whereas the panda bear, you know, is um, right considered to be the lowest bear population. But considering how much 
investment there's in panda bears, it's unlikely to go extinct and that China probably won't let that happen. So a brief note here, the IUCN currently considers six of the eight bear species as vulnerable. The only two that aren't being the brown bear and the American black bear. I guess <laughs> to me, I'd say, you know, of the bears that are going to have the hardest time, you know, polar bear as the number one choice, even though there's still around 20,000 polar bears today, you know, they're heading towards this, this cliff edge um, as climate change from help the Arctic sea ice. So polar bears and then probably, the, I mean, the sun bear is quite in jeopardy too. It's a very small bear population. It's declined by about 30% in just three generations. And it lives in the, the tropical forests of, you know, Indonesia, it's threatened by palm oil. So I would say the sun bear is also bear species that we don't know too much about and could be very at risk for extinction. So polar bear, sun bear, spectacle bear, depending on whether or not things, you know, whether or not it can change its behavior a little bit. Um, and then maybe the floss bear too would follow that um, just because of, you know, growing populations in India, increasing conflicts, uh, drought, water shortages, which further promote conflict. So those would kind of be my, my top four at risk when I'm, when I'm thinking about this. And then you also did mention a factor threatening moon bears um, is the trafficking of them. And then also bear bile farms, which also impact the sun bear, as you point out in the book. We're not going to like go into like the graphic, the details of that for, for, you know, for listeners interested. I definitely encourage reading this book. Um, it's quite an emotionally hard hitting section, but um, can you sort of tell our listeners about the evolution of how bear bile farms have impacted sun and moon bear populations. So bear bile farms were introduced in the 1980s once they kind of came up with this method to extract bile from the galls of living bears. Before that, bears were typically poached or killed and their entire gallbladder was carved out uh, for the traditional Chinese medicine. Um, but that kind of changed beginning once they figured out this technique, 1990s into the 2000s, we saw huge increases of these bear bile farms throughout Southeast Asia and China. Um, and the issue with that is that, you know, in theory, they were like, well, this will protect wild bears because you're not killing, you know, and, and killing all these bears for their gallbladders. But at the same time, these bears aren't being bred on farms. They're taking bears from the wild to stock the farms because, you know, young cubs from the wild to be able to provide bile for the pharmaceutical industry. And so, well, yes, it's true that there's less poaching now. It's, you know, a very cruel life for the bears that are taken and it has an impact on wild populations and for sun bears too, right? So moon bears are typically the mainstay of these farms, but in some areas where maybe it's harder to find moon bears because they've depleted the populations or they just happen to see a sun bear, sun bears are taken onto the farms as well. So it does have an impact on wild bear numbers. And I think it's you no, know, I, I don't think that scientists have fully quantified what that is, but, you know, there have been thousands and thousands. I think the current estimate is maybe 10,000 bears uh, on farms in China alone. Um, and when you consider some of these populations, there are only you know, 5,000 or so sun bears, maybe, and 40,000 or so moon bears. It's you know going to have an impact. In the book, you mentioned that there's actually been a lot of public backlash to bear bio farms, uh, especially in China. Can you talk about the, the social climate around that? Yeah, I mean, we within China, we've mostly seen, I think, foreigners criticizing China. We had seen a bit of an increase in some Chinese citizens pushing back against bear bile farming. I'd say Vietnam is where we've seen more action from local citizens. There's lots of groups that are pushing for Vietnam to end bear farming from within the country, um, where they think with China, we haven't seen nearly as much progress in terms of shutting down bear farms. It's still very much legal, the billion dollar industry there. So I think the tide is shifting in some of these other smaller hot spots of bear farming. But for now, China has remained pretty, pretty untouchable on this issue. We have, yeah, we've seen some council people try to introduce, you know, legislation, but it hasn't made uh, much progress. And we saw China also recommend uh, bear bile as a treatment for COVID during the pandemic. I want to go back and talk really quick about the 2005 legislation in Vietnam um, that criminalized harvesting bear bile. But it seems like you would actually have to be caught in the act in order for that that law to be enforced. Can you talk about this for a little bit? Yeah. So Vietnam made a pretty, you know, lauded step forward by 
banning or making bear farming illegal in 2005. However, they hadn't really thought through their full rule, which was, well, what do, we, what do you do with the bears, right? So they, they had to kind of backtrack and say, keeping a bear is fine. You can keep a bear as a pet and you just can't take its file. And for people to actually be charged or, you know, thrown in jail for extracting bile, they have to be caught in the act. And there's not much enforcement to it. So basically, bear bile farming has remained, you know, more or less legal in Vietnam um, for nearly two more decades. Uh, and that's, you know, about to change. Things are, things are moving in the right direction. Uh, but at the same time, too, you know, hopefully during that period, there were fewer bears being taken from the wild because bears were microchipped in Vietnam. So they should ostensibly, you'd be able to tell whether or not the bear was like a legal pet bear that might still be having its bile taken versus a new bear coming into, into these farms. However, when I was traveling in Vietnam, and this didn't end up being in the book, but we stopped at um, one of the villages near Hanoi that was still a bear bile hot spot. And we went in to this kind of weird garage situation. There was a caretaker there who was making eggs and porridge for the, for the bears. And there was a large adult bear and there was a, a cub. It was maybe less than a year old. It was a tiny bear, clearly not... You know, they were kind of like, oh, it's the mom and the cub, but it was clear the cub had been taken, as they later admitted, from the, you know, from the wild because they couldn't breed them. So for sure, new bears have still been coming into farms in Vietnam from the wild during this period. And what's the, what the new development that's, that's going to uh, take place now? Wasn't there, is it related to that piece of legislation that was passed in 2017? Yes, yeah, so in 2017, the Vietnamese government signed an MOU with animal welfare groups that they would move every single bear that was still on a bear bile farm into a sanctuary, into a rescue center by the end of 2022. COVID has delayed that slightly. They've also had to increase sanctuary capacity in Vietnam. They didn't have enough places to put the bear. So we've seen this huge building boom in sanctuaries. There's another one opening this November by Animals Asia in central Vietnam uh, when I was there. A new sanctuary had just opened by Four Paws International. Free the Bears was expanding their sanctuary. So we've seen this huge expansion of space to take all of, you know, there's about, and when I was there, there were about 400 or so bile bears left in the country. You know, they each require quite a bit of an enclosure to be able to, to go there. So basically we said, yes, every single person has to give over their bear by the end of 2022 and it will go to one of these sanctuaries. And so they are pretty close to fulfilling that now, this final sanctuary has space for, I think, about 200 bears, and that will kind of be the, the be-all and end-all of bear farming in Vietnam when that happens. Um, it, but in order to get, to get the bears from farmers, they, I believe they have to voluntarily surrender them, correct? Uh, can you talk about how that, how that process takes place? They do, and that's because, of course, there's an issue if you were to pay someone for their bear, right? If you were to to say, we'll give you money in exchange for bears, that could create a new kind of trade of people taking bears from the wild in order to get paid for the bear. Um, so they basically are working on kind of shifting social sentiment in these remaining hotspots of bear bile farming. Instead, the NGOs go in, they have conversations with people, they run medicinal cl- clinics, offering alternative medicines, herbal medicines to people instead to use. Um, they work with children, you know, children of bear bile farming families uh, to kind of shift, you know, drawings of little bears and things like that. And so we're, we have slowly seen a tide change, I think, in a lot of parts of Vietnam. It's no longer seen, you know, and also bear bile farming doesn't generate a lot of money. It's kind of a status symbol, but it's not like rhino horn nor tiger parts that are bringing in, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. It's really cheap. A vial of bear bile sells for like one US dollar. Um, so this isn't really a huge moneymaker for them. So they're trying to just more sort of shift the the perspective of these villages around it and hope that they'll give their bears a better life. Yeah. One thing that shocked me was finding out the cost of it. I had erroneously assumed that it was a lot of money because why would someone keep bears for decades uh, unless they were making lots of money off it. And it was just actually not that much. So that really surprised me. There is some hope, though, here, because you, you say that the tide is starting to turn where previously like impenetrable communities that were kind of like, no, we don't give up our bears. We're not going to do it. Like it only takes just one farmer to sort of change their mind in order for the sentiment to start to take take shape. Uh, can you talk about the, the seeds of hope that are being planted from that? When I was in Vietnam, I went to uh, one of the villages in, in Phuc Tho district, which is near Hanoi, and that's kind of the biggest hot spot of bear bile farming. When I was there, there were more than 160 wild bears left in this very tiny, tiny town. 
And all of the NGOs were saying, you know, no one from this area has ever started a bear. They won't do it. We can't, this is the one place that we have had no success in getting bears, you know, volunteered to go to sanctuary from. And then two weeks after I left, I got a note from Animals Asia that a farmer there had given up his bear, Amy, to go to sanctuary. Um, and that was the first kind of crack in the, in the community. And since then, we've seen more bears coming from Sukhto district to go to sanctuary. This is where they expect most of those bears to, to, to leave from for this new sanctuary. So yes, we are seeing a big, big progress thanks to the work of these NGOs and kind of shifting that sentiment. Once one person volunteers their bear, maybe, you know, kind of other, others feel okay to, to do the same. So yeah, big success story there. Something you mentioned in the book is that Myanmar is sort of known as being like a, a wellspring for wild bears. Can you talk about the, the density and the diversity of bears that exist from this region? <laughs> I can try. I mean, it's more so just that there's a lot of wild bears left there because it hasn't traditionally had as big of a center of bear bile farming, right? So areas where you have a lot of bear bile farming, like Vietnam, ostensibly you would see wild bear populations diminish. You know, sun bears are gone from a lot of the national parks now in, in Vietnam. Um, so Myanmar has not had quite as a colorful and expansive history in bear farming, but that's also a concern to people because, you know, I think they kind of said, once you plug one hole, once you kind of fix the situation in Vietnam, does this simply shift to another country like Myanmar, where you have all of these wild bears that demand could be kind of supplied from this country instead. So I think they'll be watching other of these kind of satellite countries that have, you know, smaller industries in, in the coming years to make sure that we don't suddenly see an uptick of bears being taken from the wild there. Um, and I think too, I mean, I think places like Myanmar have been providing bears, you know, there's, there's lots of reports on kind of cross-border trafficking of wild bears, you know, people smuggling them in into Vietnam, selling orders in different countries. So it's, it's kind of perhaps already been supplying quite a few bears for farms across Southeast Asia. I want to switch a little bit and talk about the the sloth bear. Can you briefly summarize for our listeners what the main threat to sloth bear populations are? What's the main issue when it comes to human wildlife conflict with, with the sloth bear? Yeah, so sloth bears are the most threatened, I suppose, by kind of encroaching human populations across India. They are the world's deadliest bear for that reason, because they live alongside, you know, millions of people in rural villages. People are going into kind of buffer zones and out around national parks to gather mushrooms, leaves for cigarettes, you know, flowers to create liqueurs, um, where they're often getting into conflict with these bears. And What's unique about the sloth bears to some extent is they're also very aggressive. They're used to living with tigers. They have a very low, it's described as a low throttle point when it comes to dealing with people. And so when you have people who require, you know, kind of forest products for their survival and the bears are living in the same habitat, you have a lot of conflict between these two groups. And unfortunately, we often do see, you know, revenge killings of sloth bears or, you know, electrocutions, poisonings of sloth bears out of fear. Um, I'll stop there for a minute to say that I think India is a bit unique in that, you know, in North America, at least, if a, if a bear so much as like swipes at someone or even is just, you know, in bo- as in the case of Boulder, is just seen too, too frequently, wildlife managers kill it. India doesn't have that same rule. So the government is not killing sloth bears that even kill people. They just are like, you know, here's some money, here's some compensation for that. But they don't send someone out to kill that bear necessarily. However, that means that people often take things into their own hands. There's a lot of fear around sloth bears across much of India. Um, they're a very wide ranging bear in India. They're found in 28 states. This isn't just like one little enclave in India. They're, they're kind of everywhere, you know, in anywhere that you have these four zones, you probably have sloth bears. Yeah, I was just about to ask about that actually. The contrast in the way that wildlife is treated in the United States versus how it's treated in in India is apparent, like even in infrastructure and uh, in the way that they build roads. I was just talking to to Ben Goldfarb about this. Um, so do you think, though, even though that there's more violence, the deadliest bear is by the number of people that are killed by it being the sloth bear, do you think there is something to be learned about the way the public interacts with the sloth bear that could be translated elsewhere, albeit sans the death of citizens. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, I think that there's a knee-jerk reaction to kind of be like, oh, how terrible that, you know, Indians are killing these bears. Uh, but again, we're much more regressive. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people will say, and I, a lot of the conservation scientists that I've spoken to, like how important it is to have people like living with wildlife and not just like creating like these you know, separate protected areas, but having people figure out how to live closer alongside wildlife, which I think that we're pretty bad at in cities in North America, um, Canada and the U.S., right? We're very used to like the bears are here and we're here and we, we're not used and we're struggling now as bears return to new places or expand their range. We're struggling to live with these animals in our communities. Whereas in India, there's a lot more tolerance towards, you know, tigers, leopards, sloth bears, right? Par- partially out of necessity. There's just, there's just not enough space when you have these huge populations and wildlife. Although at the same time, like you could have exterminated all of the wildlife, you know? So I think there are definitely lessons that we can transfer over. And I think, you know, just being a little bit more permissive of threatening animals at times, you know, I I do think it's a shame whenever you see a bear that's being euthanized because it took a swipe at someone's pet dog, right? Or like how we manage our own, our own interactions with, with these creatures. I think too, like, you know, in Indian system, it's just, it's just behavioral adjustment. Maybe don't go into the forest to collect mawa flowers or tendu leaves, you know, early in the morning or in the evening, right? Like just shifting your, your daily patterns to try and provide more space for these animals, I think, could be critical. It was kind of like an interesting, almost abrupt 180 in the way that um, the U.S.'s sentiment was towards wildlife. You point out in the book that in the 1920s in Yosemite, they were actually inviting people over to the park to watch bears feed on trash and this this in i mean can you talk about obviously <laughs> this the the fallout from that is is pretty is pretty obvious but can you just go ahead and talk about the history of that real quick trash eating bears were a major entertainment source <laughs> in the early 20th century in the u.s uh i mean i guess you know you didn't really have tv best so people would basically, you know, they'd roll up and you know, they'd roll up to these these national parks, Yosemite, Yellowstone, uh, and they would have landfills or dumps within the park, right? So people would go in, they'd have their their food trash, haul it to the dump within Yosemite, and then the, all of the bears would descend eating the foods. You'd have these huge congregations of black bears eating human trash. And the tourists loved to see that. You know, these were people who lived in the city. They'd never kind of been in the wilderness before. So they'd come in, in some cases, they had bleachers around the parks and they would charge people money to um, watch the bear shows at the at the dump sites. Uh, but at the same time, it had the unfortunate side effect of people being, you know, mauled occasionally. Well, you know, at least dozens of times by bears at these like bear shows in in the parks. And so eventually they had to kind of close them down. But when they closed them down, the bears went into the campsite instead. When they closed the camp, you know, when they secured the food in the campsite, they started breaking into cars. So you kind of had this evolution of like bears getting into places they should not be driven by humans and our stupidity. It, but it, then like it, it took decades to undo like the, the social acclimatization that the bears were used to, right? Like some of those bears were, could not or didn't know how to forage in the woods for themselves. They were only used to eating trash. And I think in the book, you said it took until like 2010 before like a park official said that they finally felt like they got the situation under under control. I mean, if you had asked me in the 90s, if I knew anything about this, I would have not I would have told you I have no idea. I had no idea this was going on. So I found that really shocking. Yeah, it took nearly 100 years to kind of like finally, finally tap down like all of this like bear mayhem that that the National Park Service had essentially wrought by their early policies. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the issue with bears is that they, they, they transfer knowledge really well, right? So they kind of teach their cubs, they teach other bears how to get, how to get food. They remember things really well. They're very smart animals. They know how to, where to go back to each year with a reliable food source, right? So in order for you to kind of like fix this problem, you have to figure out one, like bear resistant infrastructure. So like bear proof garbage bins, bear proof food lockers you know there's, a, there's an impound lot in yosemite now for any vehicle that's left with food in it it gets dr- dry you know towed to this this impound lot and then you also have to wait for the generations of bears that have all this knowledge to kind of die out and become less dependent on human food 
and learn to forage, you know, wild foods again. So that takes a really long time, which is why they say, you know, 2010 is kind of, you know, we had, they had, they developed this bear team in Yosemite specifically designated to deal with bear issues. No other issues, just bears, you know, 24 seven bear calls, informing people of bears, trapping bears, moving bears. But it took like a really concentrated effort to get a handle on this. There was a part in the book where you were like fumbling with a locker, like a food locker, where you're trying to get food inside of it. And you were describing how difficult it was just to open the latch. And then you followed that up by saying that bears had been documented getting into those lockers. Yeah. I can I just was like, uh, and then there, wasn't there like a study that you talked about where they actually found that on like a problem solving level, bears were more adept than actual great apes were. Yeah, that was a very humbling experience for me. I, I struggled for quite some time. Then I went down and she was like, oh, yeah, we have to replace those lockers like next week because the bears have all figured out how to do it. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so in terms of like intellectual kind of power, intelligence, as we might say, bears have outperformed gorillas on certain tasks in terms of, you know, being able to translate, you know, images or ident identify like groups of similar images and like just kind of like translational knowledge. They're also very persistent when it comes to trying to get into things like, you know, they were doing all these studies and like big cats will just kind of walk away. They won't fuss too much. You know, but bears are problem solvers. They really want to like do the puzzle and figure it out. They like they're curious animals. Right. So I think and that's also I think why humans feel close bond to bears in many ways, because we see parts of ourselves in bears with their behavior and our own curiosity as a species that bears also tend to tend to show more than other animals at times. There was, I would like to actually talk about this because you, you, you go into it in the book, but you talk about kind of like the, the cultural, um, the cultural bond we have with bears, particularly in the United States with, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and then the adoption of the teddy bear. And then people were, you know, carrying little stuffed bears around with them. I found that really interesting. I, I admit that I did not know the full extent to which the bear craze started at that time. So can you kind of give our listeners a little bit of preview on that? Yeah. So, I mean, th there was this kind of spike of, of the bear, you know, the bear craze that happened with a teddy bear. I would argue, you know, it precedes that. Though. I mean, even within indigenous cultures for, you know, for millennia, we've seen bears being considered a very close human relative. You know, people presumed there were shapeshifters who could turn into bears. Bears were seen as close, you know, sh shamans grandfather, the uncle, a lot of the words in different cultures mean that for bears. So I think there was some kind of backing before we hit the teddy bear craze, you know, that lends credence to this idea of a very close bond between humans and bears. Um, but yeah, so basically when, when Teddy Roosevelt, he was on a bear, bear hunting trip in Mississippi, uh, he was supposed to shoot a black bear that some of his friends had tied to a tree. And he was like, no, that's not very sportsman like to do this. There was a cartoon that was drawn up in a local newspaper that showed that depicted the scene called Dry the Line in Mississippi. A, a toy maker allegedly saw this cartoon and was inspired to make the first kind of teddy bear, as we know. And that kind of, you know, led to, I guess, the resurgence of, of the bear, perhaps in more modern cultures and this, this all out obsession that I think cont continues to this day, right? Most people have a teddy bear as their first kind of animal form that they encounter in this world, which I think, you know, maybe has precipitated a, a kind of more tolerance for, for the species than we provide other animals like wolves, for example. Uh, and yet at the same time, as gladly many of the bear species are rebounding. Another note here, the word species is misused. I should have said numbers as the number of bears, including brown and American black bears and panda populations are indeed rebounding, but not many of the species were, you know, as you outline in the book, we're encountering more and more issues with them and how to and how to live with them. I would argue we're we're not doing so great with that, especially especially when it comes to the brown and black bears in the United States. So. I don't want to like try and draw solutions out of you because you, I, I know you don't want to like offer false seeds of hope here, but what, if anything, do you see that we're doing differently now that maybe we didn't do in the past that is working? Well, we stopped hunting a lot of, a lot of bears in terms of, you know, brown bears and polar bears, which I think has allowed for the re return in many areas. However, we have seen movements towards trying to bring back trophy hunts of grizzly bears in you know, the lower 48 states of the U.S., um, but that obviously has a huge impact on populations. I think we've made, you know, we've, we've 
we've worked as a society, I think, to improve our own, you know, tolerance for bears on the landscape, animals that can kill us, no less, on the landscape by trying to give them more space, right? To buying up kind of conservation easements around national parks. Um, you know, having bears on the ESA means that you can't just, Endangered Species Act means that you can't just shoot a bear that comes into your cows, right? There's protections in place that prevent perhaps some of those, you know, the worst forms of human nature from taking hold legally that you can't just do this, right? Like you often, I often see news alert that people, you know, who might shoot a grizzly bear, um, you know, self-defense claim, you know, and these things are really heavily interrogated as to whether or not that, that holds up, right? These, these matters are taken very seriously if, if you kill if you kill a, a, a grizzly bear, I think black bears, it's a different story. You know, there's 900,000 black bears throughout Canada and the U.S. They're not as protected. Um, and so you do see, you know, bear hunting seasons. You do see a lot more regressive behavior around black bears. And I think the important thing is making sure that those sentiments don't also transit over into species that are quite threatened with extinction still, right? So trying to you know, to what extent does, does kind of permit having these bear hunting seasons for black bears create more of that bloodlust for brown bears too, right? And we have seen movements within state legislatures to try and get more hunts and more um, kind of, you know, American West manifest destiny sentiment um, through through the court to be able to hunt bears and do different tactics. So there's another thing that I wanted to talk about. Uh, and I don't know how much of this has to do with just the fact that we have cell phones on our on our uh, cameras on our cell phones nowadays, and therefore it's being captured more. But it's to me, it almost appears like people are taking riskier decisions, you know, making riskier choices in how they interact with wildlife. Um, I, I feel like every other day we're witnessing some joker in Yellowstone, like trying to run up to a mama bear and and her cubs. In your work and in your reporting, do you see this as kind of like a growing trend at all? I think that like bear jams, <laughs> bear, jam, bear jams is what they call kind of the traffic jams in national parks and everyone kind of slams on the brakes on the highways and get them in their car to go see the grizzly bear near the road. I think that those have always kind of been a phenomenon. I mean, I remember, you know, as a child going to Bat National Park and that was very much the case that people were getting way too close to wildlife. Maybe they had their big bulky you know, home video <laughs> recorder, camera camcorder at that time. Right. But I do think that like that kind of, I don't know, pe people kind of lose their minds when they see a bear, right? Like, they're just like so excited by it that I think to kind of have like these risky be behaviors either way. I think people who are hiking in the backcountry tend to be a bit more aware of things. You know, they have their bear spray. They're probably going to behave correctly. I think the kind of crazy behavior you see is like the roadside bear viewing. And I think in that way, it's gone on for a long time. However, the flip side of that is I do know that there have been a few people who have been killed in India by sloth bears because they were getting too close recording them with their, with their um, iPhones or with their cell phones. That's happened in India of people like having risky behavior of seeing a bear, like walking right up to it and being mauled and killed. Um, but I think in North America, I don't know that I would say it's... I, I don't know, humans have always been a bit stupid. <laughs> I don't think the iPhone changed that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, <laughs> good point. Um, so what's the solution to that then? I, I mean, I, I, I would like to say off the top of my head, education, making sure people understand that these are dangerous animals that can kill you. Um, what in your work have you witnessed works in getting the public to, to live more peacefully and safely with these animals. I think bears are a weird one because, you know, people do love to see them and they love to get close to them, but people are also very, very afraid of bears, right? Like they have that like, duality to their nature. So I think, you know, compared with bison where people might kind of run up to it and get gored, I, I don't know that people do quite the same thing with bears. I think the national parks typically have been quite good at managing those sorts of encounters. Like when there is a bear jam or when there is a, you know, they're kind of pinged in right away. They get out there, they try and manage crowds and keep them away. Um, you know, the groups that I worked with in Boulder that I mentioned in my book, the Boulder Bear Sitters, uh, it was a citizen, volunteer citizen group that was basically staking out underneath trees uh, in Boulder whenever a bear came out and was sleeping in the tree to try and keep people away from the tree, right? Because otherwise there was concern that people would be you know, cute little cubs in the tree and they would run up to it and they'd be attacked. And that would mean that the bear would be killed. 
um, so that, you know, they'd be with pots and pans and whistles just to keep the bear in the tree until it could go back home at night. So I think, you know, there is management options that can be done to try and educate people, keep them away. But I do think that people do still have that like natural fear instinct as well with bears that, you know, they're not going to probably run up to as, quite as close to a grizzly bear, right? They're going to be a little afraid still, which I think is key that you don't have with other animals. So you wrote this book sort of examining how humans interact with bears and what that means for, for bears. Um, but I actually found it to be really applicable to pretty much just everything and how humans interact with the natural world. I mean, I could point out a lot of depressing examples like where we're just falling short, obviously, climate change, biodiversity loss. So I wa- wanted to ask you, what is it you want people to take away from this book? Is there anything that, that people could take away and apply to other problems we're experiencing that you want people to sort of remember or keep in mind? I said they cheated a little bit by covering a very charismatic animal. And I think that's like the way to get people engaged often with like the biodiversity crisis, right? I think, you know, sometimes there's a stigma around writing stories about tigers and bears and lions because, like, you know, they get so much attention. But I do think like if you're going to have people care about like disappear, the disappearing natural world, like if they, if they don't care about bears, they're probably not going to care about like banana slugs or insects, right? Right. To try to get people to care more about biodiversity through kind of these eight, you know, you know, self-proclaimed very charismatic animals, this very charismatic species to try and get them to understand, like, you know, bears are important. It's important to protect bears because it protects other species. But it's not, as you said, it's not just a, a bear problem, right? This is happening to all animals. Bears as, you know, top carnivores, there's, there's fewer of them. They require a lot more space than other species. They're harder to protect. If we can protect bears, you know, ideally we should be able to protect other animals that are much easier to protect too. Um, Yeah, I think I think I hope we'll just kind of walk away with an appreciation for, you know, the species, but also our own cultural connection to bears and how long it's persisted. Right. This isn't a new phenomenon. It's dated back thousands of years. You know, Greek philosophers thought that we were closely related to bears. And I think, you know, our movement through the world and how we've migrated has often followed the tracks of bears. You know, we've, we have a very close bond with them. Um, and I hope that that bond can inspire us to save them and also inspire us to protect other species that might not be getting the same amount of attention. Well, Gloria, thank you so much for, for speaking with me today. Where can people find more information on your book or purchase a copy? They can head to www.norton.com, which is my publisher, to purchase a copy, or they can check out my website at gloriadickey.com. All right. Thanks so much for joining me today, Gloria. Thank you for having me. If you want to check out Eight Bears by Gloria Dickey, I, of course, heartily encourage you to do so by clicking the link in the show notes or in the article released of this podcast episode. And as always, if you're enjoying the Manga Bay newscast or any of the podcast content, such as our sister series, Manga Bay Explorers, and you want to help us out, you can spread the word about the work we're doing by telling a friend. Word of mouth is still the best way to help expand our reach. But did you know you can also support us by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Manga Bay. Manga Bay is a nonprofit news outlet, so even just a dollar per month does help us offset production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, go to patreon.com forward slash Manga Bay to learn more and support the Manga Bay newscast. You can also join the listeners who have downloaded the Manga Bay newscast over half a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from, or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either App Store for the Manga Bay Newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. As always, you can definitely read our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. Or if you prefer to follow us on social media, find Manga Bay on most of the social platforms out there, which is increasingly a lot of different places, including LinkedIn, Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, Mastodon, Facebook, and TikTok, where our handle is at Mongabay, and of course on YouTube, where our handle is at Mongabay TV. We really appreciate you tuning in. Thanks as always for listening.